Hello, everyone, and good morning, and welcome to One Civil Law, where, as always, we learn through the misfortunes of others. I am your host, Uncivil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the U.S. Supreme Court. And as always, I hope you're having the bestest of days. We turn our attention once again to the case of James Crumbly. James Crumbly is accused by the great state of Michigan of involuntary manslaughter. His son, Ethan Crumbly, went into a school and shot four people using a handgun that his father had purchased for him and by all accounts was left in the house in a unsecured manner. No lock, no trigger lock, no safe, no anything. He just had complete access to the firearm. And also there is testimony and evidence that the child was disturbed and therefore this combination was a toxic combination. Thus, he essentially, for lack of a better description, to keep it simple, recklessly recklessly allowed his son to do it. He recklessly entrusted, we would talk about as a separate concept, the sort of idea. Like, I know for a fact that you're a drunk driver, and maybe even more the point, I know that you're drunk right now, and I give you my car. That would be an idea, right? Reckless entrustment. Entrustment as I, I'm trusting you with the thing, the car. Reckless is I'm knowingly disregarding a known risk, namely the fact you're drunk, slash have a history of DUI, slash whatever the case may be, right? So that's the sort of idea if we want to, want to, want to put it in that frame, reckless entrustment. And so he gave his child a firearm or allowed his fire, child to have a firearm to use to shoot up the school. That's sort of the idea. The problem, at least to my mind, for the case is the foreseeability. You know, if I give you a car and I know that you're drunk when I give you, the foreseeability of DUI accent is a lot more foreseeable. The problem here is the foreseeability element in my view. It's not quite as foreseeable because it's, it's a little tangential. No person thinks, you know, a person who's drunk, you give them the keys to your car, Drunk driving is something that we should all pretty be familiar with at this point. But the idea that your child is going to go do a mass shooting at a school, probably not that foreseeable. You're talking about a one in a million event. And so the, the proximate cause, which is another way of thinking about this problem, you know, how far down the chain of continuation it is, it's, is it close enough? Is it, is there enough, is it close enough in, in, sequence of causation to hold someone accountable. So causation, in fact, yeah, but for buying the gun, the school shooting doesn't happen, so causation, in fact, but proximate cause. Is it close enough in the chain or is it too attenuated? And for my money, I think it's too attenuated, particularly if you take the Court of Appeals at its word, where you're supposed to be able to prove that they would be, that they would have been able to predict that a shooting was going to happen on that particular day, which is what the Court of Appeals wrote twice in their decision, but was not a factor in the jury instructions for his wife, which struck me as odd. So we'll see how that's all going to come about. So that's sort of where we are. And good morning to you. I hope you're having a great day and a great and awesome day. I'm feeling very positive. I went with my good friend and yours, Attorney Tom. You know him, you love him. He's less active on social media these days, but that's okay. He's married and expecting a kid now. Plus, of course, he runs his own law firm with 12 people as the sole partner. And he's involved in Logan Paul stuff and everything else. So, you know, other aspects of life have gotten in the way from his content creation, but that's okay. Anyway, I had... I met, went to a comedy club with him last night and saw him do a stand-up set, and you know, not bad. It was enjoyable. So stand-up may be in my future something to work on. Also, on a personal level, uh, I did sign a client for a US Supreme Court cert review slash petition slash argument depending on how far down the chain we go, ultimately. So I won't tell you more about the case, obviously, for privilege reasons, but I did sign a client who wants me to review his case out of the, out of, uh, the Court of Appeals uh, and to review it and at first give an impression about my opinion about the thing, 
And then if I feel and we decide together that there's enough merit to go further than to file the petition, and if it's granted, then argue the case before the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm excited about that. I, I went to the bank the other day. That's why I wasn't available, because I had to go to the bank and set up an interest-only lawyer trust account called an IOLTA account. And I had to get that set up so that I could receive the money because, you know, ethics. So I have money sitting in my IOLTA account now. Not my money because I haven't earned it yet. It's a trust account, but it's sitting in there. And so I'm looking forward to getting start to work on that today. And I'm very happy about that. And it should be interesting. And I kind of hope I'll write, I'll, I hope I'll be able to write the cert petition. It'll be interesting because one of the more expensive aspects of it will probably be the printing. I want to, because the Supreme Court, for whatever reason, has these really weird printing requirements. I don't know, because it's the Supreme Court. Like, they want it printed on six and an eighth by nine and a quarter paper or something ridiculous. No one makes paper this size. And it has to be perfectly bound, and the paper has to be 40 pound weight, and so forth and so on. So I actually went to a print shop the other day and be like, can you give me an estimate for how much this would cost? And they said we'd get back to you and then didn't. So, yeah. But uh, the print cost will probably be a couple thousand dollars, I'd imagine. And then you have to print 23 copies of the thing. I don't know why. Don't ask questions. It's just the rules. I mean, there's only nine justices. Why am I making 23 copies? I suppose one copy for each of their clerks. I, I, I don't, I honestly don't know. I, I just, I just follow the rules. I don't make up the rules. I just follow them. And so we'll go from there. And then of course I have to file the, I would have to file the petition and then I'd have to file the response. And then if granted, I'd have to file a merit briefs petition and the response. So I'd have to send at least four things of this, right? So the printing costs will get expensive. I, I, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me by the time we're done if well, the printing costs are in the several thousands of dollars. You know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me because it's just, it's just a pain in the ass. But what can you do, man? It's just the rules. Although, of course, it's not my money because it's the client's money because the client's hiring me to do the job. But still, it's just like, it's just annoying. You can't do electronic submission. A lot of courts will let you do elect th elect things electronically. Inclu federal courts let you do things electronically. Does the Supreme Court let you do things electronically? Oh, no, no, no. They sure don't. Got to file that paper, baby. 23 copies. Yeah. <laughs> In six and a quarter, six and an eighth by nine and a quarter, blah, 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 whatever paper that I, who comes up with this paper size? <laughs> eh, man, what can you do? So I'm a practicing attorney again. Hooray. Why is the sign on the self say X users, user doesn't exist? It does that sometimes. It's best ignored. Yeah. In addition, parties who are represented by counsel must also submit electronic versions. Yeah, so in addition to filing paper, I also have to su submit it electronically, which, you know, fair enough, I suppose. It's just like, why can't that be the official thing? So yes, I also have to submit it electronically. It's just, I, I have to submit it in paper. I, I don't know. It's just, I, I don't know. I don't know what they do with the paper copies. I don't know if they have a paper party with them. I, I don't know. It's, what do you want? Did I get my groceries? Hopefully today. I ordered from the Walmart app. I ordered from the Walmart app, and it's supposed to be here at 11. I'll let you know. And as I pointed out to my clients in the retention agreement, I literally put it paragraph one. 
because I don't know, like I had, you know, I have paragraphs where they're like different, you know, different things. Like I have a, par I have a, I have a section privilege, right? So it's labeled privilege and then it tells them the rules on privilege, right? I have a rule that says, I have a thing that says conflict of interest and there's a long thing on conflict of interest, which basically boils down to, hey, I'm a general practice lawyer. So at some point in the future, I may represent your enemies against you in some action that isn't this action, but some other action. So just to let you know in the future, I may wind up suing you, or more to the point, my future client will wind up suing you, and you can't bitch at me that I took their case. That's basically what it boils down to. And there's a lot of verbiage to explain that. Um, and then there's a paragraph that says how I'm to be paid, you know, what the rules are on paying me, and so forth and so on. And literally, section number one is no guarantee of success. And I, I literally put in there, you know, I'm not promising success. I have actually spell out, you know, the Supreme Court grants less than 1% of petition requests, which is true. They do. They grant less than 1%. And then I point out, even if your case is accepted, there's no guarantee they'll decide in your favor. And there's also the possibility, which is true, that they might decide against you in a way that further harms your legal interests. Right. So I, I point out that, you know, these are all very distinct possibilities, which they are. So I, I've, I point this out to just say that, you know, I've alerted my client to the possibility or a very strong possibility that the Supreme Court is going to laugh in their face no matter what we do. Um, but, you know, in the event that the Supreme Court grants it, then I get to go to D.C. and make oral arguments. And that will be good for the grift. I mean, that's got to be worth a couple of live streams right there for the entire LawTube community, right? Law tube goes to the Supreme Court, possibly with me getting my teeth kicked in. Could be fun. And if I win, well, that's really good for the grift. <laughs> you know, if I actually managed to win, that'd be really good for the grift. So, hey, we'll see what we can do. Do I include in the agreement yeah, I'll discuss the submission on YouTube? Case number fh no, I didn't include that I discuss it on, on YouTube. I did say that any, conver any conversations we have is privileged, which by this, which is why so far I haven't told you anything about what court it's out of, what the case is about, who the client is. I haven't told you anything other than someone hired me to take a case, right? I haven't told you anything because it's all secret. It's all privileged. But if we start filing things in public in the open, then I, I'll, I may talk about it because, well, at that point, it's public because we filed. So until, until, until I actually file something at the U.S. Supreme Court, I won't be commenting about it publicly in any, speci any specificity because, of course, it's privileged. But if we file something, then it's out in the open, so sure, what the hell, right? Oh. Oh. Yes, thank you. Although I have to consult the ethics rules a little bit on exactly well, what I'll be able to say, because there are rules, because I am the attorney and I'm practicing before the court at that point. So I am somewhat constrained. I'm not, compl there are, there, I'm not, it's not a lot of constraint, but I will have to double check the rules just to make sure that I don't trip on the edge, right, on such issues. Detective Adam Stoyle. I'm excited. I had to order a whole bunch of printer paper because I want to print the, I want to print the cases out so that I can actually read them. You know, I'm going to re 
just to tell you a little bit about how I plan on doing it, at least start, right? I'm going to start by looking at the Court of Appeals decision, obviously. And I'm going to look at all the briefs that were filed before the Court of Appeals. So I'm going to look at every case that both parties cited, you know, obviously, in the Court of Appeals, plus the decision, anything they happen to cite. So I need to print all those cases out. So that's a fair amount of paper. And I want to just print it out because it'll make it a little bit easier for me to to do. So I had to order printer paper and, you know, legal pads so I can take notes and stuff. So exciting. Someone passing through says, I don't understand why my comment was taken down. I don't know why your comment was taken down either. What did you say? Did you write in all caps? Did you uh, use too many emojis? Uh, did you use a forbidden word? I don't know. I might hire a paralegal Liz. I, I, I very well might wind up hiring a paralegal Liz. So we'll see. I'm, I'm going to get started on my own, but if, especially if we make it to, if we make it past the cert stage, if we make it to the merit stage and there, are, there are amicus briefs, which I imagine there will be, I'm going to need some help, you know, in terms of looking at that. So yeah, we may very wind up hiring paralegal Liz and or others by the time we're done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you didn't already say and spell your full name. Adam Shoyak, A-D-A-M-S-T-O-Y-E-K. Thank you, sir. And how are you employed? I'm a detective with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. I'm signed to the city of Pontiac. Okay. How long have you been a police officer? 12 years. Right around 12 years. And how long have you been a detective? Right around four years. Okay. You said you're assigned to Pontiac? Yeah, the city of Pontiac substation. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention to November the 30th, 2021. Do you remember that day? I do. Okay. Were you working? I was. We heard testimony yesterday regarding the search warrant at 112 East in, the, in Oxford, the Crumbly family home. Did you participate in that search warrant? I did. Okay. Now, if you could tell us, please, what happens um, when a house is secured for a search warrant? Yeah, so securing a house prior to uh, getting the search warrant, you're going to go initially and just kind of do an initial sweep of the house to make sure no one's inside the house. Uh, no one's injured inside of the house. And then after that, you're just going to secure the house until you get the authorization from the judge, um, just for like preservation of evidence and make sure that if there is evidence inside the house, that uh, it's not tampered with. Okay. And did you do that in this case? I did. And who else was with you? Uh, Detective McPherson, Detective Steele, uh, Detective Peschke, Deputy Zajac, uh, Deputy Mozak, and uh, Fred Brandon was there too. From the ETF? Correct. Okay. When you were sent to that location, did you know what Twitch, the Twitter thing? I'm still doing the Twitter no. thing. And when were you assigned oh, well. to this task? Um, after, after we initially searched the school, um, my supervisor at the time, was Sergeant Hicks, he uh, gathered a few people with us up and said to go to 112 East Street and secure the residence. Yeah, okay. I think this trial so is scheduled for two weeks. Sounds right. And you were tasked with securing the, the residence at 112 East in Oxford? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been admitted as. People 270. Sir, is this a photograph? This photograph fairly and actually depicts the address at 112 East. It does. Okay, describe the layout for us. That's a small this house. Is, uh, when you walk in here, that's the front. That is very small. Basic East Street. Um, walk in. Um, to your immediate right, there's a living I'm not area. sure that we saw pictures of the last trial. If we did, I, I don't remember um, it. I feel like this is the first time I've seen pictures of the house. Table, that's a small house, man. Through that, there was a kitchen. Yeah, my counter for the Twitter's kitchen. broken. That happens. Two bedrooms, one on the right, one on the left, the bathroom. And I'm going to show you this yeah. as well as 205. This is cash of the home? Correct. Okay. And so we have a front entrance at the top of the diagram here? Correct. Okay. Can you just walk us through here? Yeah. So uh, where the sheriff's symbol sign is there at the front of the residence, um, you walk in. So be on the left of this picture here is the living room. Um, there's some couches. There's a TV stand. Uh, table to the right there of that was a dining room. There's a, like a kitchen table, uh, some chairs. I think there was some workout equipment in there. Um, past that, there's a little opening right there, which led to the kitchen, uh, refrigerator island, some cabinets. Um, so right there to the left um, would be the entrance. There's a little hallway to two bedrooms. There's one bedroom that's north bedroom. There's a bathroom between that 
you know, across the hallway. It was right in the middle bedroom. Uh, it was a bedroom, so then uh, you come out of there, there was a little hallway. Uh, there was an opening to like the landing that led to the basement, the foyer. And then it was, what was the master bedroom it was immediately past that. Okay. Now, prior to participating in the search of this home, did you learn which bedrooms were associated with the shooter? I did. Which one? So, in this picture here, you'd see North Bedroom was one of the shooter's bedrooms, and then directly across the hallway, which is labeled Middle Bedroom, there was also the shooter's bedroom. Okay, so his rooms were, what we have labeled here is North Bedroom, and then Middle Bedroom. Both are adjacent to the bathroom, and Middle Bedroom is adjacent to the master bedroom. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Now tell us, <clears throat> when you first entered the home to secure it for a search warrant, did you see anything of note? Yeah, so obviously when you're, you're kind of just doing the search, but you're obviously still, if, you're, if you see things, you take a mental note of what you see. Um, and when I walked into what I was described as the master bedroom, there was an open uh, six-hour gun box on the bed, and next to that was an empty box of uh, nine-millimeter ammunition. Okay. That as well. Did you touch that? I did not. Okay. So when you see something like that, what do you do? You just kind of take a mental note of it, um, and obviously once you get the authorization from the judge and the search warrant, you're going to go um, search the house, and my partner and I were tasked with searching that bedroom, so okay. we were aware before we came in. So after the home security, you confirmed that, well, first of all, when it was secured, did you encounter either James or Jennifer Crumley? I did. I had a uh, brief encounter with James Crumley. Okay. Is he in court today? Yes. Can you please point to him and describe something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing the suit with the blue shirt and the blue tie. You're under the record reflect identification defendant. The record is so Tell us where you encountered James Crumley when you arrived on scene. Uh, when I initially got there, he was secured in, I don't remember who, Deputy Mozak or Deputy Zajac's uh, patrol vehicle. Okay. Now, if... An admitted video of, an, of a patrol video indicated 2.46 p.m. arrival on November the 30th, 2021. Does that seem right to you? Yes. Okay. Did you speak with Mr. Crumley? I did. Okay. Um, did you speak with him on scene there or when he was transported to the substation? So I had a brief conversation with him prior or at the substation, really nothing of note. But he was taken back to the uh, residence, and that's where I had more of a not in depth, but more of a conversation with them outside of the residence. Okay. So I'm going to show you and play what's been admitted as people's 300. This is the entire video that you reference. This one is the bottom one. Thank you. Now with me right now, we can get the you here. with me, baby. I, uh, yeah, damn it's in September. I, uh, yeah, damn it's in the night away. I, uh, yeah, damn 
dancing in September. Mm -hmm. Everyone dance with me. When they search your house, where do the residents do they go during a search? It depends on the search warrant. They can go to the places where the items they are looking for are likely to be found. So if the container is too small for the item they're looking for, they can't look in the container. So I don't know. If they're looking for a car, right? They can look and they have a search warrant for your house. They could look anywhere a car would be. So they can't look inside, you know, a shoebox. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Items to be searched or the items to be seized may be reasonably located is basically the short answer. Within the scope of the search warrant, of course, because the search warrant itself may also limit the parameters depending on how exactly it's written. And we've seen debates like that before. For example, we saw one where there was a search warrant for a house or a property and there was some debate about whether the building they searched was actually on the property or not. I think it wound up not mattering because the people actually wound up consenting to the search. But there was a debate about whether or not the building was actually on the property identified in the warrant. So, so that I don't know if that answers your question, but there you go. Does that appear right to you? It does. Okay. Now, you said, Do you wish that high pitched wine wasn't getting the way of your jams? Back. You could hear that? Yeah, there's a pretty I was kind of hoping my filter on, would so filter it out. Initially, we were kind of instructed to take James to the substation and interview him. Um, after a conversation with, I believe, Sergeant Bryan, it was a term that he had already spoken with uh, detectives prior to us getting there. So he was taken back to the house um, while we were waiting for the search warrant to be uh, completed. Okay, so we hear testimony in this. In this Sergeant Brian B. And then at Why is Jennifer? PM. And this occurred after, is that right? Yeah, uh, if your question, did you have some conversation with James about obtaining a search warrant? Why is Jennifer Hans and not his? Yeah, I understand your question. Okay. If She's your question is why are they tried arms? separately, it's because their defenses were mutually inconsistent. Namely, they point the finger at each other. Been recorded on the entire video system as well. Yes. Let's show you. Admitted, like, for you, is it 204? This is a portion of the video from 3.42 p.m. on November the 30th. You heard it, unfortunately. I was kind of hoping hey, the filter would filter it out. I could try a high-pass filter. Let me see if I can find one. Hold on. Do you remember how to do a high-pass filter? Do, 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 do. So what's going on is we're waiting for uh, to complete the search bar, okay? How about now? So what we're going to do is we're going to, you guys, obviously, while we're waiting to go into the house, we can't have you guys go back in right now, just while we're waiting for the now? Bar. So you're more than welcome to either sit in here, you're more than welcome to get in your car and hang out until this is done, you're more than welcome to go get a cup of coffee if you want or something, but it's probably going to be a little while. Um, so it's kind of up to you, but while we're waiting for that, we just have to have a please don't go inside the house. You still here? Um, 
In the meantime, can you tell me where those nuns are going to run your house apart? Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're in, uh, in a gun, gun case. We're, we're, we're at the house. And if you go to the very back of the, 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 very back of the house. We're like the Dosky to sit in? Yes. Okay. Yes. And he's not. Yeah, he's not too nice. So you guys can just be cognizant of the doors. We have cats. Okay. Okay. Um, but if you go into that back bedroom, you're going to dress around the left with the TV sitting on. Yeah. yeah. The very right cabinet door. Okay. Inside of there, there's a black gun case. Okay. Okay. And then there's some 20, it, there's just, there's only a 20, there's a 22. Um, there's high pass okay. filter out the lower um, frequencies? It looks like it okay. does. Or oh, is it is exactly the opposite? Do I need low pass? It looks like high pass is what I need. Is this right? This is low pass. Is low pass right? Opposite? You need high pass? Or is this right? You don't hear it now? Okay, so I need a low pass filter? Cool. Great. And that's, that's the only, oh, okay. And then in the bedroom to the left of the, um, the left of the bathroom, okay. Low pass, low frequency scathe through, scathe through unscathe. Unloaded. It's a really high noise, so I need a high pass filter because it's really high. That's right. Okay, so I'm just a moron. Hold on. Yeah. Are you gonna want to well, if I go up to like well, I mean, 10k, you know, what do you want to do? if I do a low pass at 10k, can you still hear it? Okay. Do you want to go with your this is a low pass yeah. at 10k. Can you still hear it? Am I? You know, did you talk to Sergeant Ryan earlier? Yes. Okay. He's gonna call you when you guys are able to come back. Okay. Okay. It's back. Um, I'll need my phone back. Uh, yeah. Let's try 5k. It's around 2k, you think? So I need a, I need a, is it really that aggressive? That's a lot of, that's a lot of signal to lose if it's at 2k. That's a lot of signal to lose. Um, All right. Well, we'll play with it as necessary. We'll turn it on as necessary. We'll try to get it right. Yeah, there, there was multiple. There were two detectives. There was deputies on scene. Um, I didn't take part in placing your handcuffs. Um, up to the deputy that put her in handcuffs. The deputy You'd have to have a notch filter to right? get Correct. rid of exactly that band. Yeah. yeah, I could do that too. Just know in this, this interview with James Carl To just exclude car, exactly what I need to exclude, I could do that too. The code was zero, 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 four zero. Is that right? Correct. Did you subsequently recover that safe? I did. Is it four zeros or three zeros? It was three zeros. Did you come to learn what the default code is for that safe? It's zero, zero, zero. So, <clears throat> what did you find inside that safe? Yes, yeah, so inside the safe, there was a 22 Caltech handgun and a 22 Derringer, which is like a single shot handgun was inside of the safe and it was opened up. Okay. Once the search warrant was officially authorized by the judge, did you participate in the search of the home? I did. And there are actually two occasions on which detectives entered the home with authorization from the search warrant. Is that correct? Correct. So once was November 30th, the evening of the shooting, and their time was September, I'm sorry, December the 13th? Correct. Okay, both 2020. Obviously. Correct. All right, I'm going to take you through some photographs of the home. Um, first of all, prior to a search warrant being executed of somebody's residence, are photographs taken? They are. Are they taken before or after the home is searched? Uh, before. Okay. So any photograph received from November the 30th, 2021, was taken before the room was searched by an detective? That's correct. This is exhibit 249. Tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, so the initial picture, that's the front door of the residence, right? You walk into your immediate right, there's couches and a TV uh, in the living room area. 
So I'll try to take us through the home as you would walk through it. So we have the door in, in the frame here. Correct. That's okay. the front door that faces East Street. That's the front door in the living room. Okay. This is 250. What is it? It's just a uh, wider angle. That's the couch that we saw in the initial picture. The other couch that that would be facing the front door. Okay. So if you step into the front door and you turn to your right, this is what you'd be looking at. Correct. All right. This is Exhibit 251. What is this? Yeah, same thing. Right when you walk in the front door, this would be to your immediate right and kind of straight ahead. There's just the couches and then a chair, table. Okay, here's 252. Again, we see the front door. Yep, so that would be, now you'd actually be facing the front door. That was just the TV stand, which had the TV on it towards the front door. Okay, and you told us that there was the living room and then in the same area you, you described the dining room? Correct. This is exhibit 272. What do we see here? Yep, so that was the dining room. It was... Uh, Christmas decorations, uh, dining room table. And this photograph was taken on December the 13th. It's small, but... Yes, this was not a guy. So this is if you quaint. walk in the front door and you turn to your left. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, you walk in, your immediate left would be this. And here's 273. What are we seeing here? Yep, so that'd be when you walk into the right was the living room, to the left was the dining room. Yeah. Directly ahead of the dining room was the doorway. It's not particularly it's messy. It looks like it's been back. lived in. You know, okay. especially for a small house, but There's you know, it's not completely disorganized. Yeah, so this would just be a, a picture of the kitchen, the island, the refrigerator. And as you can see further down, in the how big is this place? Okay, in so square this feet. If you step towards that hallway, towards is the kitchen, my apartment bigger than this house? Be, it might be. It's got to be close. Okay, we'll talk more about the kitchen in a few minutes. First, I want to take you through uh, one of the shooter's bedrooms, identified as the middle bedroom. This is exhibit 206. What do we see here? Yep, so that would be, there's a hallway, there's a bedroom to the left, bathroom, bedroom to the right. This is the bedroom to the left, which is the middle bedroom. This is a small house, uh, laughing backwards. I mean, they can get smaller, but for a fam room. family of three, it's, wall, it's, a some, little, uh, it's a little on the petite side. Targets. Yeah, or targets. Okay, and as a police officer, you've been to a shooting range before, is that right? Correct. Okay, these type of targets consistent with That's a, not a double wide, it looks like a real right. house. Okay. It's just and a very small real house. November the 30th, 2021? Yes. This is exhibit 207, are we in the same room? Same room, just uh, off the bed there, there was that, uh, a desk with a TV, um, things all over the floor. Um, that, that was a natural state of the bedroom we got in the house. When you say natural state, that, that's before the detective search. Yeah, correct. And this plywood right here, can you tell us about this, please? Yeah, so that um, that part of the bedroom actually leads, that would have been a window that would have gone to the master bedroom. Um, I believe the master bedroom is probably an add-on. Um, so that would be a window that would lead you to the master bedroom. Okay, so so we're making sure we're oriented. This middle bedroom is adjacent to both the master bedroom on one side and then the bathroom on the other. Correct. Okay. This is exhibit 208. Is the same room from a different vantage point? Same room, yeah. The, uh, just another little uh, dresser there, the closet on the left. Okay. Yeah, I know the Twitter counters doing this Twitter thing. Same thing, just the uh, various things on the floor, clothing, um, the chairs, same bedroom. And exhibit 210? Yeah, same bedroom, just kind of an outer shot that shows the, uh, the whole bedroom there. Sir, as a, as a detective, tell us why it's important for someone to capture a the natural state of something from different angles. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, when you conduct a search warrant, obviously you, you want to be cognizant of the fact that someone's house, you don't want to tear the house up, but I mean, you're going to go through the house and things are going to get moved around, uh, do your best to clean up afterwards. But uh, when you want to, the picture of this can show you what the house looked like right when you walked in. Nothing was changed and what the livable conditions were when we got there. Okay, and is that also why you would take multiple pictures of one bedroom just from different angles? Correct. Yeah, just so you can get a full shot of what the, uh, was actually going on inside the bedroom. This is exhibit 211. Is this also the middle bedroom? That is, yeah, it's the closet in the middle bedroom. Exhibit 212, same closet? Same closet. You can see there in the bottom on the chair was the uh, butt of the, uh, which Mr. Crumley described as like the um, rifle style BB gun. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. This is exhibit 213. What do we see here? Yeah, those are the, uh, the targets I described earlier. They're, Visibly confused. Um, they visibly that they had bullet holes in them, multiple bullet holes in both of them. That was on the wall right next to the bed, the shooter's bedroom. This is exhibit 214. Yeah, same thing, just a different angle. Um, that's the bed to your far left, and then the, uh, the used shooting target on the top right corner. If there were any other posters or pictures on the wall, that would have been depicted in the photographs of the detectives. Is that right? Correct. 
This is exhibit 215. There's a picture of the bed. There's clothing, clothing, some school books. There's a bunch of different stuff on the bed. And so where where the 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 targets that were in the wall, they'd be just where this uh, photograph cuts off at the top. Yeah, right? just above the bottom, okay. the top part of the target would be, or of this picture, is where the targets would be. Okay. Here's 216, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so that's uh, like a nightstand just off the bed, um, various things on the nightstand. And 242, this is a closer version, close, excuse me, a closer photograph of the items on the nightstand. Yeah, correct. It was um, various spent shell casings. Um, looks like various uh, caliber spent shell casings inside the uh, plastic container, which is on the nightstand, which is directly next to the uh, shooter's bed. And this is exhibit 243. You mentioned the butt of the, the rifle of that gun in an earlier photograph. Is that what you're referring to? Correct. When I was speaking with James earlier, the video you played earlier, you kind of described that was the one he told me not to be. Uh, freaked out about um, it was the BB gun rifle that was on the uh, in the shooter's bedroom on his computer chair. And that's how it was when it was found. This is exhibit 244 with it. So that would be part of the dresser there that the TV's on. Um, he had various, there was a notebook there, uh, pencil, stuff like that. His wallet, um, that was on the TV stand. In, in the middle bedroom still? Correct, so the middle bedroom. Okay. And 245, same drawer, different angle? Yeah, correct. It looks like there's a lighter. Um, groceries, groceries lighter are still hypothetical at this point. They say they're so they arranged, the arriving yeah, between 11 and 12. Yeah, so we'll um, see. And is it well, that's central time, by the way. Yep, so we'll see if they show up in two hours. Uh, three hours. The end of the bed. Now, I'm going to move on to the north bedroom. This was identified as the shooter's other bedroom? Correct. Okay, so this would be the bedroom on the other side of the bathroom? Yep, so when you came into the, out of the kitchen, you made that right. Did I use No, I used Walmart Plus this, this time. Let's see if they do the any right. better. It's going to be the bedroom we're going to see now, which is the north bedroom to the left of that middle bedroom, which you guys just saw in the picture there. Okay, so here's exhibit 217. What are we looking at here? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of a... Uh, a shot of the overall bedroom on the right, um, which is also the shooter's bedroom, second bedroom. 218, same north bedroom, but from a different angle? Correct. It would be right when you walk into your immediate left. There's a TV stand, a TV, um, some clothing on the floor, and on your right there you can see the bed, which had uh, various things spread all over it. Okay, again, this is the natural state of how you found it? Correct. 219, what are we looking at here? Yep, so that would be you walk in, you make a left. At this point, they're kind of rounding the bed. I'm sorry, 282, I misspoke. It would just be the picture of the uh, of the bed, and then on the, in the far left corner, there is a litter box, cat litter box on the ground there. So far left corner? Yeah, so the gift right there. Yeah. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, just various clothing and other items on the bed. Uh, 219, are we still in the north bedroom? Correct, it's the closet, closing the closet. All right, 220, what is this? It's just a bed. Um, again, various things on the bed. Um, this is 247. Yeah, so that was a notebook that was recovered in the bedroom. Obviously, it's some pictures of a life on it. Like another handgun in the bottom left there. Okay, that's 247. That was found on the bed in the north bedroom? Yeah, correct. Uh, here's 221. Are we still in the north bedroom? Yeah, so that's just now you're like looking out towards the bedroom. That's the, that doorway to the far left is the door that leads you out of the bedroom. That open door was the open door to the bedroom that we saw that initial picture. Just straight directly across the hall. They were both the shooters' bedrooms. Okay, did you observe anything on the shelf? <laughs> yeah, there's some uh, knives, various knives on the shelves. Okay, and that's depicted in exhibit 248? Correct. And then finally, exhibit 222. This is standing in the north bedroom looking down at the TV with me? Yeah, was the, the TV stand is getting a little fireplace there and various items on the TV stand. Okay, so we, we mentioned the bathroom that is adjacent to these two bedrooms. This is exhibit 223. Does this accurately depict what you observe that day? Yeah, it does. Now, did you also participate in the search of the master bedroom? I did. Okay, you mentioned what you observed during that um, process when you secured the home, but you participated in search as well? Correct. This is exhibit 224. What do we see here? 
Yes, you'd walk into the master bedroom, which you'll see other pictures here, but to your immediate right, the master bedroom is the bed. Um, right when you walk in, this is the first thing you can see was the open gun box. Um, in that box next to it is an empty box of uh, nine millimeter ammunition. And this is exactly how we, we saw it when we did the initial search of the house. And then when we came back in, once the search warrant was granted, this is, this is how it was when we came in. Okay. And this box right here is the uh, empty box of ammunition, the red box? Correct, nine millimeter ammunition. <laughs> This is exhibit 225, this is the same master bedroom? Yeah, just kind of a different view, but that's, uh, that view you make a right of the bedroom, the bed was against the wall, and that was one of the sides of the bed. Exhibit 226? Yeah, same thing, just the other side of the bed. So that, that far window right there on the left would be the window that would face the backyard of the residence. Exhibit 227? Yeah, far left side of the bed there. Um, that's the outer window that faces the backyard, and it's just floating on the ground. Okay, 228, this is still in the master bedroom? Yep, so that's the door there to the master bedroom. Um, when you walked in immediately, on the side door here? Correct. Yep. Okay. And on the wall there was an uh, armoire. Uh, on the far, on the immediate right was an armoire. And this is exhibit 229? Yeah, just a different shot. That's the door, immediate right to armoire. Uh, your left, and that picture's the bed. Just so we're clear, all these pictures of the master bedroom were taken November the 30th before the room was searched. Correct. Now, uh, was the TV stand searched as well? It was. And that's where James told you to look for the 22 caliber firearms? Correct. Uh, exhibit 230, this is the TV stand I'm referring to? Yeah, so that was what James had described when I spoke with him. Um, that's the TV stand, right? And you walk into the bedroom uh, to your immediate left was that TV stand, multiple drawers and a TV on it. Uh, but then the door you're seeing, there was like a sliding glass door that would lead you to the outside back area of the residence. This is exhibit 231, this is a straight on view? Correct. Exhibit 233, this is angle to the left? Correct. All right, 234, what are we looking at here? Yep, so um, that TV stand we just saw, the furthest right door that was opened up, and that was where the uh, the gun box was, or the gun safe was located right there on the top shelf, as it is in the picture there. Okay. And that was um, recovered by you? It was. Okay. And did you use the code 000 to open it? I did. It didn't open with that? It did. Okay. Was ammunition found? On that shelf as well? Yep, so when you when the uh, gun box was removed from there, there was uh, two magazines, the holster. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see there, uh, there's a box of uh, ammunition there in the back. Okay. You say holster, what we're looking at, the object on the right, that's the holster? Yeah, it's like a cloth holster, a black cloth holster. This is exhibit 235. 236, were those items from that right um, drawer taken out and put on top of the TV stand? Yeah, so at this point they were removed from the picture you just saw. They were put on top of the TV stand. On the left there you can see the two magazines, gun magazines up, and then there's the bag bag with the uh, ammunition in it. And then I think at the right there's the box for the ammunition. Okay. And that's 22 caliber ammunition? Correct. Okay, did you participate in the search of the kitchen as well? I did. First of all, here's 237. This is what, let me ask you, what did you, what is this picture? Yep, so the um, black firearm there is a 22 uh, Caltech handgun that was recovered when I opened the safe. Uh, the, the silver uh, gun there is a 22 Derringer. It's a single shot gun that was also found in the uh, in the safe once I opened it up. And then there was a, another uh, magazine there in the far left. It's kind of hard to see. And then there's some uh, ear protection. The orange ear protection is also located in the safe when it was opened. So this is 238, what is it? That's the uh, 22 Derringer that was recovered in the safe. And 240. That's the 22 uh, Caltech handgun that was recovered in the safe. Okay, so this is 276. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Yep, so that would be the kitchen, uh, the pictures you saw earlier. Uh, that, that would have been on the right hand side, and you saw the pictures of the kitchen. It's uh, refrigerated. Okay, so I'm going to try to take us around the kitchen. Is it, well, first of all, is there an island in the kitchen? Yeah, so um, when you're looking outside of the kitchen, there was an island in the middle. Uh, there was across from that, was like a sink, some shelving units, and then all across from the island is this, which is the fridge, more shelving units, um, all located in the kitchen. Okay. This is 278, so this would be on the other side of the kitchen? 
Yep, correct. So that would just be when I described the other side of the island, you have the sink there in the left, uh, the stove, um, and just various cabinets and other things in the kitchen there. Did you have occasion to search in this island here? I did. Okay. This is 277. That's the island I'm referring to? Correct. All right. Exhibit 253. Tell us what we're looking at here and where it was found. Yeah, so on the far right corner there, you can see a black, uh, which was later discovered to be a black gun box there in the far right corner. Let me back up for one second. So we're talking about oops, sorry. this cupboard here, the right cupboard? Of that I island? believe it was, yes, the right Okay, cupboard. and that's 277. Here's 253. Right. Yep, so there in the far right corner, you can kind of see that black. It's located there in the island on the right side of the island. Okay, and was that... Is that removed? It was. Okay. It's so exhibit 255. What is it? That's, that's just the uh, the gun box was taken out of there. Uh, that's just the picture of the gun box. It was the gun box for that Caltech, that black uh, firearm that was found in the bedroom. This is the gun box for that 22 handgun. Okay. And this is 256. What are we looking at here? Yep, the, the gun box was opened. Um, it was obviously empty beside that uh, cable lock was located inside of the gun box. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the keys to the gun or to the cable lock there in the bottom part of the baggie there. Uh, yeah, that's how that was located when it was opened up. Did you or any other detective find any other locking mechanism for a fire anywhere in the hall? No. No other locking mechanism anywhere in the home. Makes you wonder what happened to the other cable locks that were sold with the other guns, to be honest. But. I used to play three and a half when I was in college. That's what I'm used to, is playing three and a half. But um, I'm happy with fifth edition. Correct. Okay. I do appreciate um, that you didn't ask me about fourth. Right. Well, we're looking here in 257. <laughs> we've all decided to forget about fourth edition, right? Residence. Okay. Yeah. 258. Yeah, those are um, games for that uh, gaming system: Battlefield, uh, Assassin's Creed, Battlefront. Um, just various games that were located inside of the residence for that gaming system. All right. Here's 259. Yeah, it looks like those are more games: Grand Theft Auto. Uh, we're going right, first edition, that baby. Out. Calculate yeah, the fact that the there was a vehicle, a great Kia that was located in the driveway. Uh, Mr. Crumley's vehicle. Uh, it's a picture of the, when the trunk was opened up, what was in the back of the vehicle. Was there any, uh, was there a garage or a shed associated with the home? Yeah, no garage. So um, the first picture we saw was the outside of the house. There was a, or a driveway to the left of that that led to the backyard. And in the backyard, there's a shed in the backyard. But there was no enclosed garage or anything like that. Okay, was the shed searched as well? The shed was searched, sure. Right. Here's exhibit 298 before we get to the shed. What are we looking at here? Yeah, it's just like an overhang. Like, I want to see the floor. There's a grill out there. It's like a seating area which is on the back of the residence prior to getting to the shed. Okay. Here's exhibit 299. Like chaos shed neutral. Correct. That'd be fun. Exhibit 264, are we seeing here? Yeah, so you walk into the shed immediate, immediately through the door to the right, there was uh, a couple of uh, BB guns right meet against the wall. As you can see, the one, the brown one to the far left of the picture, and then the black one, which is rested against kind of the door frame there. Okay. Exhibit 265. Yeah, just a different angle. Uh, you can see the, the black BB gun in the right corner. The I should get back into D&D, &D and I should, like, do modules or something it's so we can do, like, one-shots. This is, like, on the workbench in the might be fun there. for members. Um, some BB guns recovered. That's, like, a easy style uh, BB gun that was sitting on the bench when we went inside of the shed. You can see the 267. Another BB gun. It's, uh, like, a 357 seat. That was uh, seated on, same thing, right by the Uzi there. You walked in, there was a big, a big bench, and that was on the bench when you walked into the shed. Okay. Here's exhibit 268. Yeah, so you can kind of see the uh, work area there in the back where the BB guns were recovered. It's just kind of an outer shot of some of the chairs and the, and the floor of the shed. Okay, it's a little bit more messy there. Uh, 269, where are we looking at here? Yeah, so that was outside of the shed. It was various uh, 
the other two containers which are used to shoot BB guns, power guns on the ground there. Okay. Mute the mic during uh, snorts. Hopefully I'm not doing many snorts these days. Where was this taken? I'll try. Yeah, so when you, as I described, when you walk in the hall. I wish there was a mute button on the mic. That'd be nice. Like, uh, landing that led you to the basement and to the outside. I need a mute button. I need a cough the button. To the right to the, to the back and exhibit 295? Yeah, I think it's kind of a landing, just an outward picture of that. Once you go over to the right, it's that door that reaches the backyard. And if you went down the way to the left, it would take you down into the basement area of the house. Any areas of the home that were not photographed during the execution search warrant? No, everything was now, we heard the video where you told James that he and his wife could leave. That was time stamp at 3.42 p.m. At some point, did they return? Yep, so um, after we were done with the search warrant, they returned to the residence. And, I don't even know if they yeah, make such a thing. Kind of okay. there that. Were there phone scenes at that point? They were. Consumers. And at some point, were they turned over to Oakland County Computer Graphics? Yeah, they were driven back to the high school by myself and the You really person. would think that the audio uh, interfaces would have, like, a cough button on it. That'd be good. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. One moment. Some of them do have a mute button. Good morning. But morning. not this one. I'm going to take you back just to the beginning of your direct. In exhibit... Oh, this is... In exhibit... Um, Inline XLR mute button? Tool. Let me see what I can do. There. There. Exhibit 205 is the map that was drawn. The map that was drawn of the Crumbly residence. Correct. And this is of the interior of the residence. Do you agree? Correct. Now, you also looked at the exterior of the residence because you went in the shed in the backyard, correct? Correct. And if you recall, it's a fairly deep lot. Yeah, it's got a large backyard. Okay, so. What you see from the street, the house is closer to the street than closer to the back of the lot. Would that be fair? That's fair. Okay. So it's not like a, a small backyard. It's it's fairly deep, which means that there's a, a lot of space between the back of the backyard and the front of the house. Is that fair? Yeah. So there is a fairly large fenced in backyard. Um, I don't know exactly how big, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was large. There's, there's a lot and here's of one on Etsy. It's only 50 bucks. <laughs> When you first went into the home, you, you did the initial sweep to make sure that there were no other people in the house, correct? Correct. And, and that's common. That's common practice for executing a search warrant, securing a premises. Correct. And in the home, you noticed that there was an open six.